Chapter 6. Harley Baker, M.D., had a small general practice in Montana, Oregon, which was legitimate and barely paid for the diesel oil he consumed each weekend participating in the rallies for vintage tractors, which were the vogue in Sahara. His real income was earned in his freak factory in Trenton, in which Baker jaunted every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. There, for enormous fees and no questions asked, Baker created monstrosities for the entertainment business and refashioned skin, muscle, and bone for the underworld. Looking like a male midwife, Baker sat on the cool veranda of his Spokane mansion, listening to Jiz McQueen finish the story of her escape. Once we hit the open country outside Rolf Martel, it was easy. We found a shooting lodge, broke in, and got some clothes. There were guns there, too. Lovely old steel things for killing with explosives. We took them and sold them to some locals. Then we bought rides to the nearest jaunt stage we had memorized. Which? Barrettes. Traveled by night, eh? Naturally. Do anything about Foyle's face? We tried makeup, but that didn't work. The damn tattooing showed through. Then I bought a dark-skinned surrogate and sprayed it on. Did that work? No, Jiz said angrily. You had to keep your face quiet or else the surrogate cracks and peels. Foyle couldn't control himself. He never can. It was hell. Where is he now? Sam Quatts got him in tow. I thought Sam retired from the rackets. He did, Jizbella said grimly. But he owes me a favor. He's minding, he's minding Foyle. They're circulating on the jaunt to stay ahead of the cops. Interesting, Baker murmured. Haven't seen a tattoo case in all my life. Thought it was a dead art. I'd like to add him to my collection. You know I collect curious, Jiz. Everybody knows that zoo of yours in Trenton, Baker. It's ghastly. I picked up a genuine fraternal cyst last month, Baker began enthusiastically. I don't want to hear about it, Jiz snapped. And I don't want foil in your zoo. You get the muck off his face, clean it up. He says they were stymied at General Hospital. They haven't had my experience, dear. Hmm. I seem to remember reading something once, somewhere. Now, where did I? Wait a minute. Baker stood up and disappeared with a faint pop. Gisbella paced the veranda furiously until he reappeared twenty minutes later with a tattered book in his hands and a triumphant smile expression on his face. Got it, Baker said. Saw it in the Caltech stack three years ago. You may admire my memory. To hell with your memory. What about his face? It can be done, Baker flipped the fragile pages and meditated. Yes, it can be done. Endocrine disulfonic acid. I may have to synthesize the acid, but... Baker closed the text and nodded empathetically. I can do it. Only it seems a pity to tamper with that face if it's as unique as you describe. Will you get off your hobby? Gisbella exclaimed in exasperation. We're hot. Understand? The first that ever broke out of over Markdell. The cops won't rest until they've got us back. This is extra special for them. But how long do you think... You, we can stay out of Wolf Martel with foil running around with that tattooed face. What are you so angry about? I'm not angry. I'm explaining. He'd be happy in the zoo, Baker said persuasively, and he'd be undercover there. I'd put him in the room next to the Cyclops girl. The zoo is out. That's definite. All right, dear. But why you are worried about foil being recaptured? But why are you worried about foil being recaptured? It won't have anything to do with you. Why should you worry about me worrying? I'm asking you to do a job. I'm paying for the job. It'll be expensive, dear, and I'm fond of you. I'm trying to save you money. No, you're not. Ah, then I'm curious. Then let's say I'm grateful. He helped me, now I'm helping him. Baker smiled cynically. Then let's help him by giving him a brand new face. No, I thought so. You want his face cleaned up because you're interested in his face. Damn you, Baker. Will you just do your job or not? It'll cost 5000 Break that down. 1000 to synthesize the acid, 3000 for the surgery, and 1000 for your curiosity. No, dear. Baker smiled again. 1000 for the anesthetic. Why anesthesia? Baker reopened the ancient text. It looks like a painful operation. You know how they tattoo? They take a needle, dip it in a dye, and hammer it into the skin. To bleach that dye out, I'll have to go over his face with a needle, pour by pour, and hammer in the indogatin disulfonic. It'll hurt. Jezbella's eyes flashed. Can you do it without the dope? I can, dear, but foil? To hell with foil. I'm paying 4000 No dope, Baker. Let foil suffer. Jez, you don't know what you're letting him in for. I know. 
Let him suffer. She laughs so furiously that she startles Baker. Let his face make him suffer, too. Baker's freak factory, factory occupied a round brick three-story building that had once been the roundhouse in a suburban railway yard before jaunting ended and the need for suburban railroads. The ancient ivy-covered roundhouse was alongside the Trenton rocket pits, and the rear windows looked out on the mouths of the pits thrusting their anti-grav beams upward, and Baker's patients could amuse themselves watching the spaceships riding silently up and down the beams, their portholes blazing, recognition signals blinking, their holes ripping with St. Elmo's fire as the atmosphere carried off the electrostatic charges built up in outer space. The basement floor of the factory contained Baker's zoo of anatomical curiosities, natural freaks and monsters bought, hired, kidnapped, abducted. Baker, like the rest of his world, was passionately devoted to these creatures and spent long hours with them, drinking in the spectacle of their distortions, the way other men saturated themselves with the beauty of art. The middle floor of the roundhouse contained bedrooms for post-operative patients, laboratories, staff rooms, and kitchens. The top floor contained the operating theaters. In one of the latter, a small room usually used for retinal experiments, Baker was at work on Foyle's face. Under a harsh battery of lamps, he bent over the operating table, working meticulously with a small steel hammer and a platinum needle. Baker was following the pattern of the old tattooing on Foyle's face, searching out each minute scar in the skin and driving the needle into it. Foyle's head was gripped in a clamp, but his body was unstrapped. His muscles writhed at each tap of the hammer, but he never moved his body. He gripped the sides of the operating table. Control, he said through his teeth. You wanted me to learn control, which is I'm practicing, he winced. Don't move, Baker ordered. I'm playing it for laughs. You're doing all right, son, Sam Quat said, looking sick. He glanced sidelong at Jizbella's furious face. What do you say, Jiz? He's learning. Baker continued dipping and hammering the needle. Listen, Sam. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, Sam, Foyle mumbled, barely audible. Just told me you on a private ship. Crime pays, huh? Yeah, crime pays. I got a little four-man job, twin jet, kind they call a Saturn Weekender. Why Saturn Weekender? Because a weekend on Saturn would last 90 days. She can carry food and fuel for three months. Just right for me, Foyle muttered. He writhed and controlled himself. Sam, I want to rent your ship. What for? Something hot. Legitimate? Nope. Then it's not for me, son. I've lost my nerve. Jaunting the circuit with you one step ahead of the cops showed me that. I'm retired for keeps. All I want is peace. I'll pay 50000 Don't you want 50000 You could spend Sundays counting it. The needle hammered remorsefully, remorselessly. Foyle's body was twitching at each impact. I already got 50000 I got ten times that in cash in a bank in Vienna. Quat reached into his pocket and took out a ring of glittering radioactive keys. Here's the key for the bank. This is the key to my place in Joburg. Twenty rooms, twenty acres. This here's the key to my weekender in Montauk. You ain't tempting me, son. I quit while I was ahead. I'm jotting back to Joburg and live happy for the rest of my life. Let me have the weekender. You can sit safe in Joburg and collect. Collect what? When I get back. You want my ship on trust and a promise to pay? A guarantee. Quat snorted. What guarantee? It's a salvage job in the asteroids. Ship named Nomad. What's on Nomad? What makes a salvage pay off? I don't know. You're lying. I don't know, mumble, mumble. Foyle mumbled stubbornly. But there, but there has to be something valuable. Ask Jizz. Listen, Quat said. I'm going to teach you something. We do business legitimate, see? We don't slash and scalp. We don't hold out. I know what's on your mind. You got something juicy, but you don't want to cut anyone else in on it. That's why you're begging for favors. Foyle writhed under the needle, but still gripped in the vice of his possession, was forced to repeat. I don't know, Sam. Ask Jiz. If, you're, if you've are if you got an honest deal, make an honest proposition, Quat said angrily. Don't come prowling around like a damn tattooed tiger figuring how to pounce. We're the only friends you've got. Don't try to slash and scalp. Quat was interrupted by a cry torn from Foyle's lips. Don't move, Baker said in an abstracted voice. When you twitch your face, I can't control the needle. He looked hard and long at Gisbella. Her lips trembled. Suddenly, she opened her purse and took out... 500 credit banknote. Two 500 credit banknotes. She dropped them alongside the beaker of acid. We'll wait a minute. We'll wait outside, she said. She fainted in the hall. Quat dragged her to a chair and found a nurse who revived her with aromatic ammonia. She began to cry so violently that Quat was frightened. He dismissed the nurse and hovered until the sobbing subsided. 
What the hell has been going on? He demanded. What was that money supposed to mean? It was blood money. For what? I don't want to talk about it right now. Are you all right? No. Anything I can do? No. There was a long pause. Then Jezbella asked in a weary voice, Are you going to make that deal with Gully? Me? No, it sounds like a thousand to one shot. There has to be something valuable on the Nomad. Otherwise, Dagenham wouldn't have hounded Gully. I'm still not interested. What about you? Me? Not interested either. I don't want any part of Gully Foil again. After another pause, Quad asked, Can I go home now? You've had a rough time, haven't you, Sam? I think I died about a thousand times nursemaiding that tiger around the circuit. I'm sorry, Sam. I had it coming to me after what I did to you when you were copped in Memphis. Running out on me was only natural, Sam. We always do what's natural, only sometimes we shouldn't do it. I know, Sam. I know. And you spend the rest of your life trying to make up for it. I figure I'm lucky, Jiz. I was able to square it tonight. Can I go home now? Back to Joburg and the happy life? Uh-huh. Don't leave me alone yet, Sam. I'm ashamed of myself. For what? Cruelty to dumb animals. What's that supposed to mean? Never mind. Hang around a bit. Tell me about the happy life. What's so happy about it?